Good morning and welcome to this week's virtual service for Good News Lutheran Church of Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today is the third Sunday of the season of Easter. And as we continue our celebration of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, the focus for our worship once again is that hope is alive. No matter how bad things get, and even when all else seems to have failed, because Jesus is alive, hope is also alive. Last week we saw how that is true, even when our hope remains hidden, even when the things that God has promised us all seem off in the distant future instead of right in front of us in the present. Today we're going to see that even when what we see in the present, when the circumstances and events that are right in front of our faces seem to cause us to think that hope is dead, even then hope is alive. We'll see Jesus open our eyes to be able to see that even the things that we would be tempted to define as failure and defeat, reason to give up hope, these are the very things that God has used in Jesus Christ to bring hope to life. As we worship today, the words of our service, including the prayers and the songs, will all be displayed on your screen for you. If you'd like to follow along, being able to see the music of our service as well, you can download and print the service folder that has been provided. God's blessings to you as we worship together this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. As we come into God's presence, let us confess that often we have lived for ourselves, confident in the forgiveness of him who lived, died, and rose for us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. After his resurrection, Christ commanded his church to proclaim the forgiveness of sins to all nations, promising that their words were as certain as his. Therefore, it is by Christ's command and with his authority that I say to you, in the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.
pray. O God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the despair of death. By his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today's Psalm of the Day is Psalm 116, where we praise God for delivering us from death. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The Lord is gracious and righteous. When I was in great need, he saved me. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Today's gospel is written in Luke chapter 24. Jesus opens the eyes of two of his disciples to see that his death was not reason to believe that hope was dead. Rather, God had used his death to bring hope to life. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels, who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We join in singing the hymn of the day.
Easter tides, away with sin and sorrow. My love, a crucified, has sprung to life this morrow. At Christ, who once was slain, at this is pleaded prison. Our faith had been in vain, but now is Christ arisen, 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 but now is Christ arisen. Death's flood has lost its chill since Jesus crossed the river. So deliver at Christ who once was slain, that first is three day prison. Our faith had been in vain, but now is Christ a prison, a prison, a prison. shall rest and for a season slumber till drunk from east to west shall wake the dead in number at Christ who once was slain the first is made a prison our faith had been in vain but the word of God to which we turn our attention this morning is written in 1 Peter chapter 1. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and your hope are in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What if things were different? Evidently, that is a question that occupies the human imagination at least judging by the number of books and TV shows and movies where that's really the, the central question. What if things were different? So we might think of stories, for example, where the time stays the same, but the place somehow magically changes. The characters are transported to some alternative universe that exists simultaneously with ours. Think of stories like The Wizard of Oz, or The Chronicles of Narnia, or Alice in Wonderland, or a story like Stranger Things for a more recent example. Then there are also those stories where the place stays the same, but it's the time that changes, where the characters are transported ahead into the future or back into the past, and not just to observe things, but actually to influence things. And once again, to create this alternate universe where everything is different. You might remember that scene from Back to the Future 2, where Doc Brown is trying to explain how this works to Marty McFly. What if things were different? Throughout the season of Easter, the focus of our worship really revolves around this powerful thing called hope. The message of Easter is that because Jesus is alive, hope is also alive. And yet as we think about the hope that Easter delivers, we might be tempted to think that it's a hope that only makes a difference for our future. 
In fact, we might even be tempted to picture it this way, that whether someone has the hope of Easter or not, it seems as though we're all on the same path, almost as if we're being carried through life on the same conveyor belt. And it's only when that conveyor belt reaches its end that the path splits. The conveyor belt dumps some people into one bin and other people into another. And yet when it comes to the hope that we need and the hope that we seek in life, evidently that's not enough. I mean, sure, it's nice to know that Easter makes a difference for our future, and yet we still wonder and imagine and ask, what if things were different now? Thankfully, as we look at these verses that are in front of us today, the Apostle Peter is going to tell us that they are. In fact, he's going to tell us that that point where the conveyor belt splits and that different path emerges is not some point way off in the distant future. It's actually a point in time back in our past. The second Jesus emerged alive from his grave is really the point where that conveyor belt split and that different path emerged. And because that is the case, we don't need to be transported to some different time or some different place. Everything can stay exactly the same, and yet, because of Easter, everything is already very much different. And this isn't just in our imagination. This isn't just in fictional fantasy land. This is in cold, hard reality. As we look at these verses from 1 Peter chapter 1 this morning, we're going to see that because of Easter, we already live in an alternate universe. Really, in these verses, Peter describes two parallel universes, two alternate realities, and sort of places them side by side for us to consider. As he talks about the first one, he describes it as the way of life that has been handed down to us by our ancestors. In other words, it's sort of our factory setting. It's the way of life that we're just naturally born into. And in this way of life, the goal is to look around at our current circumstances, the conditions in which we live and the events that consist of our, that the events of which our lives consist, and to figure out how we can make them better. So we might have a job already, but we want a better job. We might have a house already, but we want a bigger house. We might have already achieved one degree or mastered one skill, but we want to do the same with the next one. And if that's the case, if that's the goal for life in this universe, then the things that are valuable in this first universe are the things that are going to help us achieve that goal. Things like money and power, things like fame and popularity, things like ingenuity and technology. Peter has something to say about this first way of life, life in this first universe. He calls it empty. He doesn't call it evil, he just calls it empty. People may very well accomplish a great deal of good in this first way of life. They might accomplish all kinds of things that make their lives and the lives of others better in all kinds of wonderful ways. And yet Peter wants us to know that our ability to take our current circumstances and improve them will reach a very inevitable and quite literal dead end. Eventually that conveyor belt runs out of real estate. And because that is the case, Peter also has something to say about the things that are valuable in this way of life. Things like money and power, things like gold and silver, as he says. Peter calls them perishable. Yes, they have the ability to make a big difference in our lives, but that difference is only temporary. So that's sort of like the first universe, the first way of life. Now Peter describes the second and in this way of life, the goal is not to look around at our current circumstances and try and improve them. The goal instead is to realize that we need to be rescued out of them. In this way of life, we, we look around and far from concluding that this world is a perfectly suitable home for us that maybe just needs to be spruced up a bit, we instead look around at our current circumstances and realize that they are ultimately a, a prison in which we are trapped, a prison that we need to be rescued out of. And if that's the case, then the things that have value in this universe, this way of life, are going to be very different from the things that have value in the other way of life. In this way of life, gold and silver can't really do us a whole lot of good. What can? Well, Peter tells us. He talks about the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. 
So Jesus Christ, God's own son, come to earth to be a lamb. To be a person whose entire job, whose entire reason for existence was to be a sacrifice, to lay down his life, to shed his blood, and to die. I mean, think about that. Death is the very thing that causes that other way of life to reach its inevitable dead end. But death is also the thing that causes this way of life, this way of being rescued out of our current circumstances, to begin. Two completely alternate universes, two completely parallel realities that Peter describes, and it sort of forces us to ask, which one have I been living in? You know, as I think about that first way of life, that, that way of life that we're naturally born into, I think a word that maybe describes it more than any other is simply that word, more. If really our goal in life is simply to improve our current circumstances, then how often don't we tell ourselves that all we need in order to do that is just a little bit more? It's just going to take a little bit more hard work or a little bit more thinking outside the box. It's going to take a little bit more discipline or a little bit more willpower. It's going to take a little bit more formal education or a little bit more real world experience. It's going to take a little bit more money or a little bit more recognition. Of course, one thing we for sure need more of if we're going to put any of those things to use and to work in our lives, we all need more time. And again, that doesn't mean that any of those things is evil. Peter simply calls them empty. Peter wants us to know that as much as they can and will make a difference in our lives, that difference has a very fixed and very hard limit. Their ability to improve our circumstances comes to an end the second our lives come to an end. And I don't know about you, but that's the thing that's really easy to forget. That's the truth about, about life in that first universe that is so easy to ignore. You know, when I think about life in, in that first kind of universe that Peter describes, I think it is just so perfectly embodied by those two disciples who were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus on the afternoon of that first Easter Sunday. Those two disciples had been fully convinced that Jesus was the one who was going to change all of their circumstances. Jesus was going to make everything better. Jesus was the one who was going to set Israel free from the oppressive Roman rule. He was going to restore Israel's borders and its glory and its power. And what had convinced them that Jesus was the one to do all of this? Well, as they said, it was his powerful words and his powerful deeds. And no doubt they were convinced that if there had just been time for more of those powerful words and deeds, then all of the hopes that they had put in Jesus would at some point be fully realized. What had caused all of those hopes to come crashing to the ground? Jesus had died. Death sort of makes it impossible for there to be any more powerful words and powerful deeds. And so what did Jesus say to them? What did Jesus help them see? Jesus pointed to the very things that had caused them to lose hope. And he wanted them to see that those were the things that he had actually used to accomplish his mission. He had to suffer. He had to die, just as the scriptures said. Jesus wanted to open their eyes to this completely alternate universe, a place where everything was different. Not the events, not the circumstances, not the people and the place and the things that had happened, but, but what those things meant, what they were seeing about those things. Easter was proof that this completely alternative reality from the one that they were seeing had already been established. And that's exactly what Peter says to us in these verses. How do we know? How do we know with absolute certainty that the one way of life is completely empty and the other way of life is not well, Peter tells us that God raised Jesus from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and your hope are in God. Easter means that we are already living in this alternative universe. Everything that has value for improving our current circumstances comes to an end when our life comes to an end. But in this alternative universe, God has taken the very thing that is most worthless for improving our circumstances, and he has made it the most priceless 
for rescuing us out of those circumstances. We don't need to be transported to some different time or different place with different events and different conditions. Even with everything staying exactly the same, Easter has made everything different. And seeing that, having our eyes open to that, that makes all the difference. In fact, that's exactly why Peter is saying the things that he's saying in these verses. It's because of the difference that it will make in our lives right here and right now. Because Easter has already established this alternative universe, Peter tells us to live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So live out your time on earth as a foreigner. If you've ever visited a foreign country before, you know what it's like to be in a place that operates on principles that are very different from the ones that you're used to. In a foreign country, there is a different language being spoken. There's a different currency being used. There are different values and different goals. And while you are in that foreign country, it's only natural that you would also operate by some of those same principles but you know, of course, all the while that you're not going to stay there forever. Pretty soon you're going to leave. In fact, the, the place that really popped into my head when I thought about these verses and, and Peter's encouragement to live as foreigners, it wasn't a foreign country. It was actually an arcade. An arcade is an alternate universe in its own right, isn't it? In an arcade, there are goals that are very different from the goals in the real world. Those cheap chintzy toys that are hanging behind the counter, things that, that normally we would care very little about. In the universe of the arcade, those become the things that we are obsessed with. In the universe of the arcade, there's also a very different currency, little paper tickets that in the real world would have no worth whatsoever, suddenly become priceless commodities in the world of the arcade. In the world of the arcade, skills that have no use in the real world suddenly become very valuable. The ability to, to take a wooden ball and roll it accurately up a ramp, or to take a, a plastic toy gun and shoot imaginary deer that are running across a screen. These are the things that define success in the world of the arcade. And it's all very fun and all very enjoyable, so long as you remember that it's temporary. In fact, maybe you've witnessed someone forget that. Maybe you've seen a child, for example, forget that there is life outside of the world of the arcade. And suddenly there are tears flowing from their eyes when the game is lost. Suddenly there is anger and jealousy bubbling up in their hearts when they see another child that has even one more paper ticket than they have. Suddenly you see their dreams dashed and their hopes crushed when they are not able to get a cheap plastic toy, but instead they need to settle for a cheap plastic toy that's just a little bit smaller. If we forget that there's an, alt an alternate universe, a life outside of the world of the arcade, then life inside the world of the arcade is completely ruined. Friends, because of Easter, we live in an alternate universe, one where the goals are different, the values are different, where the definitions of success and failure are very different. And so even as we live and spend our time in this universe, we do so knowing that we're just passing through, knowing that we are not here to stay. We do so, as Peter describes, living out our time as foreigners. And we do so, as Peter says, in reverent fear. That doesn't mean that we walk through life completely and constantly afraid. It does mean that as we go through life, we are completely and constantly in awe. A couple of weeks back, I, I mentioned that I've been reading this book that's all about the World's Fair that was held in Chicago back in 1893. That World's Fair was actually the World's Fair immediately after the one held in Paris in 1889. And it was at that World's Fair, the one in Paris, when France had unveiled this massive thousand foot tall wrought iron structure that was unlike anything the world had ever seen. A beautiful and magnificent tower that was named after its designer, a man by the name of Gustav Eiffel. 
So as Chicago prepared for its World Fair, one of its biggest goals was that its fair would feature something even more impressive, even more awe-inspiring than Eiffel's Tower. At first, all of the suggestions that they were receiving from architects and engineers all over the country really all revolved around building something that was even taller and even more magnificent. And yet after a while, they realized that all they were trying to do was simply out Eiffel, Eiffel. They were simply trying to do something that he had already done, only maybe just do it a little bit bigger and a little bit better. So instead, they decided to do something completely different. In the end, they, they didn't build a tower at all. Instead, they built a wheel, a massive 250 foot tall wheel that was suspended above the ground as if in midair, hanging from a, a single central axle. And not only did that giant wheel rotate around that axle, but there were actually 36 passenger cars attached to the wheel. Passenger cars that could hold in total more than 2,000 people who would rotate along with the wheel as it went round and round. This never before seen wheel was also named after the man who designed it, an engineer from Pittsburgh by the name of George Washington Gale Ferris. Ferris's wheel was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. And so when it opened up at the Chicago World's Fair, it was the most popular attraction in the entire exposition. What does it mean to, to walk through life in reverent fear or in constant awe? It means knowing that as God goes to work in our lives, he doesn't simply try to out mankind mankind. As he goes to work, he doesn't simply try to do the very same things that we're trying to do, only maybe do them a little bit bigger or a little bit better. No, instead he does something completely different, something completely new, something never before seen or heard of on planet Earth. He takes those things that the world considers to be so valuable for changing our current circumstances, things like wealth and power, and he has no use for them, he instead takes things that the world considers to be utterly worthless, ultimately death itself, and he makes that the most priceless commodity in rescuing us out of our current circumstances. He did that first in Jesus' life, which means that we can rest assured he will do that in our lives too. As we think about the biggest and best things that God is accomplishing in our lives, we can know with absolute certainty that it won't be by using the things that the world considers to be so worthy and valuable. Instead, it will be using the things that the world considers utterly worthless. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like in your life, but I do know that Easter proves that is the case. That is how God works. And the more that we can see that, the more that our eyes are open to that, the more that we will walk around experiencing and feeling what all those people no doubt felt the first time they saw Ferris's wheel. We will walk through life experiencing what Peter calls reverent fear. We will walk through life in complete and total awe. Friends, this alternate universe that Easter has established in so many ways is stranger than fiction. It is stranger than, than anything anyone has ever imagined, stranger than Oz, stranger than Narnia, stranger than even Alice's Wonderland. But of course, it's infinitely better too. And so we don't have to sit around and ask. We don't have to wonder or imagine what if things were different. The second Jesus emerged alive from his grave, that conveyor belt split off and that alternative path emerged. And from that point forward, things would forever be different. And not only that, but just as he did for those two disciples, Jesus continues to use his word to open our eyes so that we can see it. So that we can see that because of Easter, everything is different. And yes, that makes all the difference. Amen. We confess the Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join our hearts in prayer. Lord God, we live in a world at odds with your purpose. Open our eyes to see your hand at work among us and make our hearts burn with faith in your presence, that we may not fear but trust in you for all things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, in your word and sacraments, your Son dwells with us and your Spirit leads our fearful hearts to faith. Bless your church in its mission, that through the means of grace, many may know Jesus Christ by faith and the baptized may be sustained in hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Stay with us, O Lord, and be our strength in weakness and our hope in time of despair. Your gracious will once kept the saints in faith even unto death. Keep us, we pray, with them in your faith and fear that we may be found faithful when Christ comes again in his glory to bring to fulfillment all things once and forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hope, console the grieving in their sorrows and teach us to trust you in every situation that we may not be captive to fear but live in joy and peace through the merits and mercies of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Father, give us the joy of Christ's victory over sin and death and help us to manifest this victory in holy, upright, and godly lives. Receive our thanks for hearing our prayers and receive our thanks for giving us all things in him. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may our glorious Father, who by his power raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, give you the spirit of wisdom to know the hope to which he has called you. And may he preserve you in body and soul until your own resurrection on the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.
Thank you once again for joining us today. If you're watching one of our services for the first time today, we would love for you to find out more about our church and the good news of Jesus that we are here to proclaim by visiting our website, www.goodnewslc.org. Please know that we are here to serve you in whatever way we can. God be with you this week.